I V M. We would like to thank HDFC Life Insurance for supporting this show. HDFC Life Insurance has created an online video series called Behind the Journey with some of the most interesting people from the creative and entertainment industry. It explores the stories that are behind the glitz and glamour of the spotlight and screaming fans. Let's listen to a snippet from the episode featuring Olympic medalist Sakshi Malik. सेविंग्स और इन्वेस्टमेंट में भी डिसिप्लिन चाहिए होता है जैसे रेसलिंग में है कि वो तुरंत रिजल्ट नहीं मिलता है सालों साल लगते हैं जो भी हमने ड्रीम uh, सोचा जो हमें गोल अचीव करना है उसको पूरा करने के लिए लाइक साक्षी सेड इन्वेस्टमेंट एंड सेविंग्स रिक्वायर्स एज मच डिसिप्लिन एज एथलेटिक्स यू कैन वॉच ऑल एपिसोड ऑफ बिहाइंड द जर्नी ऑन एच डी एफ सी लाइफ इंश्योरेंस यूट्यूब चैनल दैट्स यूट्यूब डॉट कॉम स्लैश एच डी एफ सी लाइफ Take control of your personal goals with HDFC Life Insurance's financial solutions. Plan now with HDFC Life Insurance. Terms and conditions apply. HDFC Life Insurance Company Limited, IRDAI Registration Number One Zero One. Welcome to All Things Policy, a daily podcast by the Takshashila Institution. We are a bunch of policy nerds based in Bengaluru. and we like bringing fresh perspectives to indian affairs and indian perspectives to global affairs so grab a cup of coffee sit back and join us for today's chat hello and welcome to all things policy the coronavirus has been declared by the world health organization as a global health emergency with over 28000 cases reported from across the world with 400 deaths yesterday we're looking at a number of 560 plus today and it certainly seems like we're in the middle of one of the most uh, major outbreaks of a deadly virus in recent history uh, so today joining me i have dr shambhu vinayak and manoj keol ramani uh, we are going to be covering the coronavirus in china every single week going forward every friday we are going to be talking about uh, how the the world is reacting specifically how china is reacting um but first let's actually break down the basics uh, shambhvi i have a basic question for you how deadly exactly is this virus i've been hearing rumors that it could potentially have been a bio weapon that got loose somehow um do, do you think there's any water to these claims and irrespective of that um how communicable is it how deadly is it how what are the chances that if one person gets a corona virus how many other people are going to fall ill as well right so let us break that down uh, so how deadly is the virus itself so if we look at global figures the mortality rate for this outbreak is about 3% hmm. any standard flu during flu season has a similar mortality rate so if if the corona virus freaks you out please be also be freaked out about flu and make sure that you get vaccinated <laughs> because there actually is a vaccine for flu hmm. okay but it is a slightly skewed statistic so a majority of the deaths have come from inside china uh only three people outside china have died because of the virus so if you look at that is a little disproportionate numbers uh of of mortality uh what we understand is that maybe china is uh under reporting a lot of the milder cases of the coronavirus infection which other countries might be picking up because they are more vigilant uh in the aftermath of the spread of the virus um and so it is also likely that because of that under reporting of the milder cases in china itself the death rate might also be slow might also be low hmm. um what we know is that uh, people who have immunocompromised uh, systems or such as the elderly uh, are are more susceptible uh, to the virus to getting it as well as uh, not being able to recover from from the virus itself hmm. there was this heartbreaking video of this 80 year old couple from china who were saying goodbye to each other in the icu because they are likely not going to survive the infection hmm. uh, both of them had it so that's a population which is more vulnerable uh, to the virus the other thing about the virus is that it infects up to so an infected person will um, infect up to four other people okay uh, so we've done studies to to kind of identify that uh, it will spread through uh, respiratory droplets uh, so and it has a reach of about 6 uh, meters i think um so anyone within 6 meters of a person who's infected could get the virus so as far as viruses go how how communicable is it in relation to others uh, in, in in relation to for example the common flu so it is uh, the common flu actually infects lesser people hmm. uh, so i think every person who gets the common flu will infect up to one or two other people okay measles on the other hand will spread to at least 100 
meters from the person who's infected. So uh, we'll stay alive for that long duration um, in, a, in an atmosphere outside hmm. of a person. Uh, so it is quite infectious per se. It is not as lethal as, it's not as deadly as it first appeared to be of the a uh, lot of fear mongering that has gone on about it. Hmm. Uh, the 2018 Nipa case, for example, we had mortality of 88%. 88%? 88%. The SARS epidemic of 2003 had 10% mortality. Compared to that, we the, the coronavirus is a milder version. So why is it that, um, why do you think there is such a massive amount of fear mongering around this virus if it's not that deadly? Is it simply because of the scale of the problem? It is Partly it is the scale of the problem, partly it is because as with most viruses, we do not know what how to react to viruses, right? We do not have any treatments for it. For a novel virus, we do not have a vaccine. I mean, we don't have a vaccine for a lot of our other prevalent common viruses, but uh, this is completely new, so we don't know how to tackle it. Hmm. And then obviously, there was a lot of fear mongering because we did not know how it started uh, and how it has spread. So it took us a while to to figure that out. So, for example, as you said, uh, there are a lot of these conspiracy theories going on about whether it's a bioweapon. Hmm. And... To tell you honestly, we don't know yet. Okay. Uh, there have been a couple of papers that came out saying that the coronavirus and came out from IIT Delhi. Uh, saying, the coronavirus came out from IIT no, Delhi? No, no. <laughs> paper came out from IIT Delhi saying that the coronavirus is very has spike proteins which are very similar to HIV. Uh, spike proteins are the, uh, the spikes on the coronavirus itself and huh. these proteins determine uh, which host the virus can actually bind to. Hmm. Uh, so what their study showed was that uh, uh, the spike proteins on the coronavirus that has caused this uh, outbreak had some portions which are very similar to the HIV spike proteins, uh, which is what actually allows the coronavirus to now bind human cells and infect human cells. So how do they know this is not just a random mutation as opposed to something that uh, was so they, they don't know and that there's a lot of ex- extensive statistics that should have gone into their reporting to figure out what other species has Hmm. these kind of uh, proteins and they're very small chunks of protein so they're found very widely in nature okay. uh, so the paper got a lot of backlash it was it was not peer reviewed when it was published so it was published in a bio archive which is pre peer review publishing hmm. and then following a lot of backlash they've now retracted that paper okay but various agencies have come out there was someone from israel who came out and said that because uh, and a lot of this is centered because uh, wuhan institute of virology in wuhan houses their biosafety lab Hmm. Uh, so they actually had a lot of dangerous pathogens in Wuhan. Hmm. And there is a lot of back and forth about whether this is a bioweapon or not. To be honest, we don't know yet. It most likely is not a bioweapon because uh, it does not spread so much. It is not really that lethal. It has had a lot of impact on economic activity in China. Though, and I'm sure Manoj will talk about that. Hmm. Uh, so in, the current, uh, in this current atmosphere of economic warfare, bioweapon of that sort actually makes sense. Uh, but in all likelihood, this coronavirus is not one. Hmm. Uh, and either way, now is not the time to figure out what it is and what it is not. Hmm. We have to first curb the spread of this virus because it will have it is having really strong economic impacts. Agreed. Th- that I think is a, is a great uh, opportunity to bring Manoj in. Manoj, can you tell us a little bit about um, how exactly China is responding to the epidemic? As, as Doc mentioned, uh, we, we are seeing all these heartbreaking and sometimes scary videos, uh, for example, of like cops going and demanding that people not share information about the virus, uh, videos of parents and children being separated, um, which all seem very sensational and you can see how they kind of uh, contribute to this fear-mongering narrative. But what's actually happening on the ground? Um, how is Chinese society taking it? How are Chinese officials taking it? So there is a there's an interesting sort of trend. Okay, So this is not just a... I mean, in many ways, it just tells you how a health emergency can become an economic problem, a political problem, a deep social problem, uh, and a diplomatic problem between so many countries. And there are all these aspects to this right now. Um, and there is a lot that one does not know. Um, so, but I'm going to begin with the sort of one silver lining in all of this, which is that China is sort of very well known for uh, media restrictions and media clampdowns. Um, and this is one case where after a certain point of time, there has been a reasonable amount of freedom to the media to actually report. Hmm. 
Mm. Um, so the media, the Chinese media themselves have done a good job about with regard to this, uh, and which is something that goes sort of unnoticed because a lot of the focus goes on global media outlets. Um, but a lot of this coverage is actually coming from Chinese journalists. Um, so that's one thing that I wanted to sort of note. The other thing is that how did the state respond to this? So in early December, there was uh, there were signs that something's happening. By December 31st is when they actually shared the genome data with the WTO, right? The genetic data, with WHO, and uh, yet it took them a long time to sort of actually put together a response mechanism. And this has to do with the system of governance in China, where local officials firstly don't necessarily have the incentive to report problems which can be deeply destabilizing. Um, and therefore, the incentive is that uh, if you don't necessarily understand how deeply problematic this can get, you want to sort of hush it up. You want to keep it within the local realm. You don't necessarily want to let your bosses in Beijing know uh, because uh, the satisfaction of uh, your bosses in Beijing is uh, important for your political sort of promotion. Hmm. Um, so the the mayor of uh, Wuhan sort of kept it uh, controlled. Um, but and he, he, despite there being information that there were people who were actually complaining that, look, this is a SARS-like problem which is developing. Hmm. Um and those people, there were eight individuals who were actually picked up and detained because they were complaining and they were rumor mongering as the Chinese sort of legal term is. And what's happened to them now? Uh, and interestingly, uh, they have been released uh, from detention because the Chinese Supreme Court eventually made an observation. And this is all after the central government has taken note of everything and actually launched a response mechanism. Mm. Um, the Chinese Supreme Court actually said that we should sort of, in, essentially they argue that we are indebted to these people to actually raise the alarm and we should have heard them out first. Mm. And how the local police played it out was uh, that uh, they've been given education in not rumor mongering yet <laughs> no longer detaining so you don't want to necessarily accept your fault but you say that okay look we you know we made we, what we did was not right mm. but that's one example of how the chinese state sort of systematically and structurally ends up sort of failing in these cases mm. the other is and this is again something that the mayor of wuhan sort of pointed out was that uh, we knew at a certain point of time that this is a problem and we reported it uh, they didn't do it early enough but they did report it but for us to be able to launch the kind of response that has been launched subsequently, even at a local level, we needed sanction from the state council, which is the Chinese cabinet, hmm. to designate it at a certain, designate this problem at a certain level as a certain health emergency. And then we could take the kind of actions that we needed to take. Obviously, the incentive doesn't align for him to, and he doesn't have the autonomy to take the kind of actions of sort of coordinating of the city and sort of, you know, building these hospitals that you're now seeing the Chinese building, hmm. or even force people to test and all that. You need the state council to act. That, he says, delayed action. So it again tells you a little bit about the bureaucratic incentives of the system, which did not necessarily work, particularly when you start centralizing all this power and authority to do things. Hmm. How subsequently has the Chinese state responded? Well, January 18th, they sent the central government sent a team. They did an inspection. They very quickly reported back saying this is a massive problem. We need to do these. We need to take these massive measures. And since then, from January 18th, 19th onwards, you start seeing cities and going under lockdown. Uh, beginning with Wuhan and the neighboring cities in Hubei province. And today that lockdown is sort of increased to many, many cities. Again, go back to January 18th and around that time. And what you see is that um, it's holiday season in China. Anyway, businesses are shut, particularly manufacturing. Uh, lots of people are traveling back to their hometowns. This is a massive thing in China, particularly during Chinese New Year. So around say 25th Jan is when Chinese New Year, uh, it was Chinese New Year. And you have millions and millions of people actually traveling back to their hometowns from cities. Um, so there is a lot of mobility. So you have millions of people traveling from Wuhan to different parts of the country outside the country. Wuhan is a massive trade center. Um, so this disease starts to spread. And at the same time, you're trying to sort of impose lockdowns on people. Mm. Uh, yet many millions have actually traveled. Um, so therefore, the lockdown, when it began in Wuhan, it was bound to sort of expand to other parts of the country. So today you're getting reports of cities like Hangzhou, cities like Shanghai, which are in Zhejiang province, fair distance away from Wuhan, where... If, it not, if not on lockdown, you're seeing some sort of measures being taken. So, for example, uh, you've got quarantine measures like families, uh, every alternate day, an individual from a household can step out to buy supplies. There is a shortage of supplies because, again, you've locked down cities. You're not sort of necessarily providing goods and services across state borders. And that's a problem. Uh, not so much necessarily in these other cities where you've got some of these quarantine measures, but at least in Hubei province, which is the heart of where all of this is happening. So the Chinese have taken those sorts of measures where you've sort of tried to cordon people off. You've built that, uh, you've built two hospitals in record time in Wuhan. 
uh, where you try to accommodate cases. And I mean, as much as the propaganda value of 24 hour live streaming of those hospital building works, hmm. it's also in hindsight, when you have 28,000 cases, and many more to come, where are you going to have the capacity? So you need the capacity also. Hmm. Um, so they've done those sorts of things. They've also announced a lot of sort of they're trying to announce a lot of measures in terms of vaccine development in those sorts of they're trying to fund some of those things. And the idea is just trying to pool in all sorts of resources from the army, from the political establishment, from the private sector, get donations, do everything that you can to raise capital, create, put together resources to be able to contain the spread of the virus. I spoke about Chinese journalists reporting this. So uh, I, there's a certain point of time where the Chinese sort of the government realized that, look, you need to be transparent about this, at least to a certain degree, you need to be. You can't go back to the SARS-like uh, case where there was complete lack of transparency. So they have been much more transparent. But that does not necessarily mean that we necessarily have the full picture of the scale of this uh, tragedy right now that is unfolding in China. From an economic point of view, there's a massive hit. At the moment, basically, uh, initially what you did was you extended the Chinese New Year holidays to February 9th. Anyway, that's a period where economic activity is low, yet retail activity is very, very strong. Um, but what you ha what's happened is that with these quarantine measures, you've got no retail activity happening. People are not going to the movie halls. People are not going outside. Uh, people are not buying things. Stores are shutting because people can't come to work. So brands like Apple, Louis Vuitton, so on and so forth have just shut their stores. Um, there's because manufacturing is essentially seized. There's an international sort of ripple effect. So for example, Hyundai says uh, in South Korea, we need to halt production of some of our cars because supplies come from China and the supply chain gets affected. So the economic impact is still sort of early days to assess how bad this is going to be. It depends on how long the current conditions prevail. But if this continues for a long period of time, apart from what sort of activity gets hit in China, retail and so on and so forth, because this is also an economy which is moving towards greater consumption driven GDP growth, there's a greater impact on supply chains. Hmm. Um, and if this per persists for a long period of time, would we then see greater pressure on companies to shift supply chains um, and those sorts of things? Uh, yeah, so those are the sort of broad scope of sort of how the Chinese state has reacted, what sort of economic impacts we can see. Oil is another thing. At the moment, estimates tell you that over the last couple of weeks, Chinese oil consumption has dipped by 20 to 25 percent. Hmm. That's about 3 million barrels a day. Um, so that's a lot of inventory now sitting hmm. that will impact oil prices globally. Um, therefore, you have now the Saudis and the Russians talking about cutting production. And then, you know, uh, Saudis have in fact just this week said that we want to, we will be cutting production. Yet there's an OPEC meeting to happen. So there's a whole set of ripple effects that are likely to happen as long as this sort of persists further. And from a Chinese point of view, the idea would be this is a crucial political year. I mean, as this year began, the only thing from a political leadership perspective was this is the year China is going to announce that it's absolutely eradicated poverty. This is the year China is going to announce that we have entered the phase of developing what is called a moderately prosperous society, i.e. we've doubled our GDP from 2010. We have now achieved one of our two centenary goals. Um, that's a big political milestone to have achieved. And this year has began with something like this, where you now don't even know whether in March you're going to have those annual parliamentary meetings. Um, it really seems highly unlikely that they'll have them. Seems but that's so, kind of the problem. It, it seems so interesting to me just how intertwined th this problem is. You essentially have a bunch of local officials who all they want to do is basically uh, make sure they, they keep their jobs, make sure they get their promotions. They just want to keep everything running smoothly. And the way this escalates into essentially a global system where now you might very well have the entire global economy slowing down yeah. because a few people didn't have that incentives um, really shows you how interconnected the world has become yeah. um, and it, it highlights some very very interesting things about especially if you look at the way that India has responded to this India has responded um, by banning exports of N95 masks to China well banning exports completely it, of all PPE so of all surgical mask sort of items is this uh, so it includes clothing mask etc that is used for personal protection it seems utterly foolhardy it, it does not seem to take into account just the way the yeah, global so economy works what we saw was an immediate spike in the demand for uh, the N95 masks hmm. and most of India's production comes from uh, from Tamil Nadu hmm. uh, India is a net importer of masks okay so we are not like we are a major producer of the masks anyways I think a lot of our masks used to come from China and now since the manufacturing sector in China has taken a hit, there is a strong dependency on the outside. And stocks got depleted pretty quickly. Uh, I think this was a panic-stricken move that we might run out of masks for Indian requirements if the outbreak was to spread massively in India, that, that they decided to ban, uh, ban the exports. 
but it makes no sense because we really need to stop this at the source and exactly. uh, if we we are not able to prevent it spread now it's it's going to get crazy i would say china in particular is now having the second uh, outbreak of bird avian flu yeah yeah which is also going to massively yeah affect its economy so the more we can help them out i think the, the better it is for us so that's the thing the on the on the mask banning thing so there are a couple of things that india has done in in response to this uh, and some of these have come across as terribly confused you know at first level uh, you would you sort of evacuated 600 odd citizens from wuhan uh, mostly students you evacuated them and you got them back which is fine you know you felt like the need to evacuate them apart from that there are many many more indians so china has home to about 50 50 or 1000 indian citizens hmm. or 55000 so there, are, yeah, so there are many more indian citizens now already in china and that exists so fair fair enough you've seen that the people in wuhan were at the highest risk and you evacuated them but uh, there's nothing publicly about india offering to assist china in any which way um which to me sounds strange there has there should have been at least some sort of an offer yeah. the hmm. ban and there are dependency on china for medicines exactly for api is yeah. so strong we exactly. we are going to be in a crunch if china doesn't recover from this quickly exactly there is a lot of business impact in india pharmaceuticals is one sector that will be impact our agricultural exports to china get impacted because if consumption stops and everything stops uh, or it ceases significantly the agricultural exports which are your primary exports to china hmm. get hurt So again, there's from there is an economic incentive to be working together um, on this mask ban issue. I mean, Shambhavi raised the point of actually stopping the virus at its source as of before. So you're planning to hold masks in case there is an outbreak in India, which sort of in some ways makes sense. You want to have enough, you know, in India. But the other thing is that you've cut off the incentive for the manufacturers, right? You've cut off the incentive for the manufacturers, and so they will not necessarily produce. This is a great time for people to actually say, "Well, we can actually manufacture yeah. mass be- on mass basis, and we can export. Yeah. Uh, why just to the Chinese? We can export to the rest of the world yeah. also. And tomorrow, if the the virus does spread, yeah, we still need to import. Yeah, okay, because we do not have enough stocks. Yeah. And which country is now going to help us when we have said that oh, we are not going to send you any of our masks? Exactly. Mm-hmm. So I think it's to me that's a uh, absurd move in its logic. Um, the other thing that we've uh, sort of looked to do is that you know you need to be working with people, uh, different countries to try and figure out. Uh, whether you can have some sort of a diplomatic response to something like this you need to be working on vaccines on things like that no for all that you need collaboration hmm. uh, and by some of the steps that we've taken i don't think we've sort of suggested that we want to collaborate on anything we seem to suggesting that we want to be walled off and secure yeah. as much as possible and i don't know how walled off and secure you can be i mean just logically speaking from what you described doc um a virus that is that can spread to potentially four people at least that has a range of 6 meters would be absolutely disastrous in indian context i mean it if it be. actually reaches india shores it does not seem to me like any number of masks we could even hypothetically uh, like transport in from another dimension would save us uh, so it absolutely it it as as you guys said it it doesn't really add up but doesn't make yeah. sense and even the masks are not foolproof hmm. right they will they're supposed to the n95 the n95 stands for not allowing 95% of particles of 0.3 micrometers from going into your body the virus is 400 nanometers 100 to 400 nanometers is too small for the mask the, the other thing that i've not seen is there has been no public messaging in india about uh, hygiene wash your hands yeah, the there was thing had there was oh, there, there, oh, <laughs> yeah, those were all sort of i mean yeah. really uh, homeopathy yeah. i mean i would oh. i would like to see television commercials something you know yeah. like on radio on yeah. uh, on tv in local local languages uh, the fact that and this is not again this is not something that we need to do for coronavirus yeah. this is a, something that will protect a lot of us from diseases anyways like the the flu that comes every season like mm. wash your hands do not spit in the open do not cough without a handkerchief if i was on a flight to delhi a couple of weeks ago and like on both our side of the there people coughing and i was like oh my god <laughs> please use a uh, tissue or something so mm. yeah basic hygiene can go a long way yeah So uh, now there's another thing that we've been told could potentially go a long way not not necessarily by official sources uh, but both both people in India and China have said that oh traditional medicines are the way to go uh, uh drink the products of of certain bovine animals uh, or uh, or consume What is bovine animals I mean There's there's only one that I could possibly <laughs> be referring to, of course, um, or you know, consume the ground up bones of some or the other exotic creature. There was bullock horn in Chinese traditional medicine. So I mean, I, I think 
it goes without saying that it's absolutely not going to work. So please, please do not listen to anybody who's telling you to do that. Um, but what do you think individuals could potentially be able to do to kind of reduce their exposure to communicable diseases like this? So the masks do help in, in two things. One, it stops you from like touching your nose and mouth. Um, so by doing that itself, you're preventing the amount, the access of viruses and bacteria too to your respiratory system mm. and it also stops respiratory droplets so if you have an infection or if you have a cough it is better to wear the mask to protect others mm. wearing a mask particularly if you have a cough or a cold is a good idea uh, then wash your hands if you have a fever or something stay at home if you can uh, or report to a doctor and say that I have these symptoms what do you think I have um, and yeah just and I find I find it's very interesting that a lot of educated people who understand all of this will continue to go to office with a cough or cold yeah. uh, and sit in meetings I'm not referring to anything that happened today but <laughs> in our office but I, it is very surprising because we have these these conversations around all the time and yet people will look at the mask as if it's a stigma or something and it's not you're just protecting you're doing your social responsibility that's great yeah. as far as the traditional medicines thing go right A the coronavirus is completely novel so we have absolutely no idea what will work for it or what will work against it. Hmm. Actually, there was a, another directive from, uh, I think it was from the Indian government, one of the ministries that came out yesterday about a cocktail of HIV retrovirals, which can be used against uh, the coronavirus because the coronavirus does have these, some things that are uh, similar to, to HIV. And I think China is also using uh, retrovirals yeah. uh, against against the coronavirus. Again, we don't know uh, where it has been tested, what is the ethics that has been approved to actually allow this to happen so that we can see for that. But we really don't know what works. If something makes you feel better, if you think that taking steam inhalation every day is going to make you feel better, do it. Yeah, but just make sure you also wear masks in public. Yeah, it is not a guarantee that it, you will not get the coronavirus. So please treat that as a moral hazard hmm. uh, if, you're, if you're using any of the traditional medicines because we simply do not know. At the same time, I, I have a little bit of apprehension about the the backlash that these advisories have got. So the advisory should have said that this is like precautionary. We do not, we have not tested this. Uh, so the advisory that came from Ayush, for yeah. example. So it did say that you have to consult your uh, practitioner for it. Uh, but... Yeah. Like a lot of the stuff on it, like a lot of the medications are what is prescribed in, say, the Ayurveda against any cough, right? Uh, or any fever. It is like saying they take paracetamol, right? Hmm. Which, if someone comes and says, so you take paracetamol, is going to protect you from the coronavirus, you're going to be probably be thinking twice about it. No, but that's the thing, right? Because I think that Ayurveda has a certain kind of mystical appeal that that's attached yeah. to it, where people don't fully understand how it functions. Yeah. Um, so to people, to people's minds, paracetamol and Ayurveda are not the same yeah. thing. Because I, so I went and Googled all of, all of the stuff that they had written. And I said, okay, this, this is actually just an antipyretic, which is what paracetamol is. Mm -hmm. so, so, I okay. mean... But again... A lot of people in this country continue to go consult traditional practitioners. Uh, so we have to figure out a way of working with them. Just saying that what you do is not going to work is is not going to help either in the situation. People, even people who will go to allopathy first, once they figure out that allopathy doesn't have anything, might go to traditional medicine. I've seen it occur multiple times. Uh, and so we cannot just say that, okay, this is not going to work, this is never going to work. We have to find a way to work along with them. That's I know you and I have different have, have differing views on the, Look, as, on as long as you can both done. agree that drinking cow pee in the morning is not going to save you from the coronavirus I think I think we're still okay okay um cool so um where do we really go from here? Um, what do you think India should be doing next? Where do you guys do? You, do, you, do you think China is going to? Is is anything going to be changing in China, or do you do you see? Um, do you see them in basically in damage control mode right now? Because I think that Xi Jinping suddenly vanished as he tends to do when there's a crisis, and now is now resurfaced. Uh, is that an expression of 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 faith in the idea that yes, we have this under control, things will be fine eventually? Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't read too much into Xi Jinping vanishing from newspaper uh, front pages. I mean, look, this happens every other year. And this is partly about the Chinese ecosystem being a bit of a black box. I mean, people outside who are, 
you know looking at chinese newspapers every day to find a hint of something different you know a little word here that tells you that you know the balance of power within the sort of back rooms of the communist party has changed i mean this is a bit of a, a strange phenomenon that keeps playing out i don't really i didn't i don't think that one should read much into uh, him vanishing uh, occasionally here and there from newspaper front pages look at the moment Xi Jinping has a couple of tasks. He is somebody who is who's a little bit positioned a little bit above the machinery. He is a little bit above the machinery. Um sort of he's you know he's levitating about 2 inches above ground always. So you don't necessarily want to see him involved in the day-to-day nitty-gritties of things. He is convening meetings, he's talking to people, he's trying to put a plan together. and there are folks who are executing it and clearly in this particular scenario he's given his premier li kachang the one of the sort of rare opportunities to be the star in the middle and potentially the fall guy now when i say the fall guy that doesn't necessarily mean that if you know if things continue to worsen xi jinping will sack li kachang hmm. it won't happen but what will happen is that he is the guy who's carrying the burden publicly of managing all of this um and so therefore if you turn around if you sort of open chinese uh, state media and party media pages what you will see is that you will see li kachang at labs talking about vaccine vaccines you will be seeing li kachang visiting hospitals um you won't necessarily see xi jinping visiting hospitals there are two things that xi jinping will do one is convene these grand meetings sorry three things one is convene these grand meetings to put together plan of action and tell people that they need to do their jobs the other thing is that he will meet foreign leaders to make sure that things are So business as normal continues. China is open for business in some ways. We have problems, but that doesn't mean that we can't contain them. And the third thing that he will do is, in terms of any response to this disaster, he will be managing the armed forces' response. So he will be. That is where he will be directly issuing orders because he is in charge of the armed forces, hmm. um, and that is not something that he will see Li Keqiang do. um that is something that falls under his domain and he will do it so do the armed forces are they playing any role in handling the outbreak so right they now? are right so they're not up so from managing supplies making sure the supplies get into different cities to making sure that uh, armed forces medical personnel are involved in sort of fighting this to making sure that armed forces hospitals are supporting everything so there's an entire gamut of things that they are doing um and they will continue to do this uh, and this response will be managed by Xi Jinping because he is the head of the armed forces hmm. um whereas all the rest of the civilian response will be Essentially managed by Li Keqiang, overseen by Xi Jinping. Hmm. So I don't think that if he vanishes from the media headlines, sort of a couple of days, it's perfectly fine. Um, the other thing is from what does China, where does China go from here? Right now, it's really unclear. Uh, at the moment, you know, if you track, they put out a data set every day of how many new cases, how many new suspected cases, how many people have been cured, uh, and if you keep plotting that, what you'll see is that. There are oh, there have been a couple of occasions where the number of new cases or deaths has sort of dipped marginally, and there have been a number of occasions where the uh, number of people who've been cured or deemed cured has sort of increased marginally. None of that gives you a trend as to where this thing is headed. We don't know whether we've reached sort of plateau. We don't know whether we've peaked. When we hit that mark. is when one can start assessing where to where do you go from here at the moment what one does know is that uh, this is going to have an economic toll this is going to have a public security toll this is going to have a social toll because increasingly you're seeing people from hubei uh, if not just wuhan uh, in other parts of china being discriminated against right there are these massive posters being put out by people who've come back from hubei or some some part of uh, of if not from wuhan then from hubei in different parts of china and they're like oh well you're from hubei don't come here um you from wuhan don't come here there are posters where you know people who've come back have put out sort of signage outside their houses saying someone here from hubei don't come in hmm. um so those sorts of things are happening there's lots of social discrimination that's happening and there are videos of this available on social media where there's uh, this thing from italy or somewhere about this guy on guy caught on the train Yes. And and the, and the woman was like oh there's a chinese guy now you're going to get infected and he speaks back in italian saying yes. that i have always been here yes So there's a lot of that. There's a lot of international sort of uh, you know. I mean racism. Racism. Yeah. This is yeah, racism. This is racism. Uh, and not just in Italy, but the U.S. There's been so so many reports of uh, you know. Voice of America had a nice documentary where they're talking about uh, they were interviewing Chinese Americans, 
and they were saying things like well we're suddenly being told that oh great now this guy has come and we're going to get the coronavirus and the guys like look i've always lived in san francisco so i mean i don't i don't see this the worst i've seen is when they call it the yellow the yellow virus yeah. what they call it yellow virus so there's it's, it's it's horrible yeah and this is not just a western phenomenon it's also in east asia so places like thailand south korea have reported cases of xenophobia and uh, i think this is something that the chinese will sort of uh, as a social pushback it's going to hurt this is going to hurt for a long period of time uh where and if this intensifies and there are more cases uh in australia we were talking in the morning about you know chinese students being annoyed at the fact that universities are opening yet chinese yeah. students are not going to be there and chinese students are a significant component significant in australian component, universities yeah. so this is going to be something that's going to as the longer this goes and the more strain it causes on on sort of social issues like this it's going to have a broader sort of diplomatic impact also um so i think that's another thing to look forward to domestically the biggest thing to look forward to is and this is i mean it just strikes me as such a you know there's never a good time for things like this to happen but this was the worst time yeah. from a chinese political timetable for this to happen because you uh, were in a period where you were going to when you were entering this year you were entering this year with the idea that we are going to be celebrating massive wins this year and in celebrating those massive wins the year began beautifully with that january 15th trade deal with the us where you caused a pa- called a pause on this trade conflict and you know uh, you seem to be getting some degree of stability and everything today is out of the window um the fact that you might not end up holding your annual political meetings tells you a little bit about this is not going to be here to celebrate how it plays out for xi jinping and his control to me again the jury's still still out on that there are two ways so you'll read a lot of articles in uh, the new york times wall street journal everywhere else about how uh, this is an authoritarian disease and that's essentially reference to the systemic problems that i spoke about earlier but also you hear about the fact that oh this is a political failure for xi jinping and this could be deeply damaging in all of that mm. it could be it could be if he doesn't manage it i mean properly. if it prolongs and the social tensions increase and there are frictions between chinese because are, you know already like i was saying that you see videos of uh, a minder on streets where there is quarantine conditions uh, with a megaphone saying things like you know you you're staying at home for your motherland and you're doing this for your motherland so you're trying to drum up that nationalistic sentiment but there's only so much that nationalism will feed you once the supplies run out and once it becomes more difficult for a prolonged period of time people start to get irritated right hmm. um and that comes out in political frustration you are already seeing some of the uh, scholars and analysts from china uh, shu shangrun who uh, some time back wrote very critically about xi jinping uh, is again now speaking publicly saying this is a problem of your system um, so you will see criticism come out but you could also see the chinese state if this plateaus over a month or so come back very strongly in saying nobody else could have contained it but us mm. and who else can respond this way and that's another argument which amplified by party state media support can be very sort of influential you know and particularly when you are sort of in the position where you are anyway calling the nationalistic card not just domestically but also like saying well the americans imposed a level 4 travel ban and level 4 advisory in a travel ban which was not needed look the who is saying nobody should be imposing travel bans so this is the world sort of also conspiring against us a little yeah, bit yeah. hitting us when we are down and all that works very well in the long run um, provided you contain this fairly quickly but if this continues for the next 4 months and for the next 3 4 months you have got a number of cities facing sort of these quarantine or semi quarantine conditions then who knows very interesting well um i'm sure that you guys found this conversation as fascinating as i did uh tune in to our next update next friday thank you guys so much for joining me and thank you for listening to all things policy if you liked our show don't forget to check out other interesting podcasts on the ivm network you can tune into them on the ivm podcast app ivmpodcast.com or wherever you listen to your podcasts you can also follow ivm on social media the handle is at ivm podcast on twitter facebook and instagram and hey if you'd like to dive into takshashila's research on technology strategy and economic affairs check us out at our twitter handle at takshashila inst or our website takshashila.org.in I hope you enjoyed that show. We'd like to thank our sponsors on the network this week. Thank you HDFC Live for coming on board. Also would like to thank Storytel for continuing the long time advertising that they've been doing with us. And if you have a brand and you'd like to advertise with us, please send us an email. We'd love to talk to you. And let me tell you a couple of things that you should check out this week. 
On Tapri Tales, Madhuri tells the story of Manjula Taylor, who stitches buttons on each piece of clothing as she paves her way as a working mother. On the Pragati podcast, Amal Agarwal gives Pawan a tour of the rise of modern banking in India. On Edges and Sledges, there's a bonus episode out where DJ Ashwin and Varun have a special guest on, Craig McMillan, former New Zealand cricketer. On Paisa Vesa, Anupam is joined by Avinash Luthria, a SEBI registered investment advisor, to talk about five common misconceptions around investing. On Pulia Bazi, host Saurabh and Pranay discuss the randomized control trials that led to the Economics Nobel Prize. Thanks and keep listening. Hi guys, this is Ayushi. And I am Ritasha. And welcome to Agla Station Adulthood. It's a fun podcast we've got going on and we'd love for you to tune in and enjoy with us. Join us as we stop at various stations and discuss different topics that seem to be bothering us and hopefully Dating, you as well. Dating, relationships, beauty, just being an adult, lots of different things. We don't have a great grip on it, but we've done okay so far. Catch Agla Station Adulthood every Thursday on the IVM app, the IVM website or wherever else you get your podcasts.